Hi, welcome to Offscript Film Review. I'm Zach Lewis. And I'm Dr. Draper. Today on the show, we're taking a look at Jason Statham's new movie, a Guy Ritchie flick called Wrath of Man that is in theaters now. Uh, if you're not going to theaters like most of America, you might not have heard of it. But we got good news, good things to say about it, I hope, at least in my end. I don't know about Andy, but uh, we'll get to that in just a minute. We're also going to take a look at 1992's seminal classic, Bram Stoker's Dracula. Uh, starring Gary Oldman and a young Keanu Reeves and Winona Ryder. It is quite the movie. It's available on <laughs> HBO Max. We watched it, and I'm excited to talk. I've never seen it. Andy's seen it before. I'm excited to talk about it. We'll get to that towards the end of the show. We're going to look at a couple new trailers for some things coming up. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll reveal what those are when we get there. Before we get to everything, of course, we start with the news. Our first story this week, Netflix is actually releasing Zack Snyder's Army of the Dead in a lot of movie theaters. It's not just going to the streaming service, which is kind of kind kind of bananas. Andy, what what do you know about this? So a week before Army of the Dead is supposed to come out, it will be playing in uh, over 200 theaters uh, for just one week to kind of help hype up the film and and to get it on the big screen. And uh, this is a big deal because the theaters have not wanted to work with Netflix uh, for a long time, but before. Uh, but because of the pandemic, they kind of don't, don't have a whole lot of choice. They don't have a whole lot of leverage and they're starved for content. Uh, so th they worked out a deal with Cinemark and along with uh, some other smaller theaters uh, to screen the film for, for just a week and kind of, you know, get it some buzz before it comes out on Netflix. It's exciting that it's going to be out before before it comes to Netflix. Like an odd move for Netflix, right? You would think like being a subscription-based service, they would drive people to them. And it's also interesting this isn't just for Cinemark. Like you said, other theaters will be running it, uh, including IPIC, Landmark, Alamo Drafthouse here in Texas. Harkins and Sinopolis are going to be running it. Over 600 theaters in total across the country are running this movie a week early. Not on Netflix. Not Not where it's supposed to be. Here's the big question, Andy. Why? Um, it, well, it's it's advertising uh, essentially. It it helps get it out there, and if you if you're not a subscriber, you can sign up and see it, and then maybe that gets you to subscribe. And in it again, we're still experimenting with distribution models, and this is an interesting one. You know, this is a little bit different from the hybrid release. It's it's almost like a pre-release. You do a week in theaters, and then you go to the subscription service. It's also worth mentioning they have run uh, th theatrical features uh, in theaters before. Netflix has. Uh, they ran Alfonso Cuaron's Roma on 250 screens ish in America. They ran Net Martin Scorsese's The Iron Mish, uh, The Iron Mish, The Irishman. Oh my God, on about 550 screens. Uh, they do these typically for award seasons. That's a big part of that to make sure they qualify for stuff. I don't know if Army of the Dead is an award winning film. Time will tell. But uh, I, I don't. I don't think this is a bad move i mean netflix has said in the past like they don't make movies to attract subscribers they basically make them to keep them and the fact is army of the dead will be on their service long after it has left theaters so anybody who missed it in that one week can watch it on netflix and uh, it'll be fine right like they're clearly not gonna take that much of a dip right so not a bad move i guess uh, exciting news for army of the dead and uh, for mr zack snyder to be back in theaters uh very exciting next up uh, jason Statham's wrath of man Makes $8 million this weekend. Big numbers in a post-pandemic <laughs> world, right? Uh, something like that. It, it is, I mean, it is number one. It's nothing to sneeze at, but it's it's pretty small for uh, what, what is a full-fledged summer release. And it's still a lot less than, you know, some of the the other hybrid releases have made Mortal Kombat and, uh, I said Donkey Kong, uh, Godzilla vs. Kong. <laughs> um so while, while it's it's a good start um it's still not a ton and it and it, what's interesting like uh, from this article is that the hybrid release movies has actually made so much more money which is not which is the exact opposite of what theaters thought would happen yeah uh it's it's definitely exactly the opposite of what theaters thought would happen I mean, most theaters don't typically go for this hybrid release stuff it's worth mentioning uh, regarding that last story we were just talking about um amc and regal who are two very large movie theater chains never go for that stuff usually like if ever they they're, they're not even running army of the dead they're 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 not they're not into that stuff at all so a lot of theaters kind of lean away from it it's exciting that somebody's you know not totally against the idea i guess um i i guess i'm not surprised it made like eight million globally i mean when i went and saw it there were like two other people in the theater and that was a, like a prime time to go see this movie when, when did you what would it look like for you? I went your to a, uh, it was about the same i think there were five people in there in a, yeah, five, in a 500 person theater and theaters are still doing the pandemic spacing, right? Like they're still buying. I think so. Only, yes. They're only booking only half the theater. I think that's the thing that's correct. So 
no surprise, I guess. In total, the movie's going to make about twenty five point six million over the course of the weekend, uh, including global takes. So, not bad, I think, for Guy Ritchie. I don't remember how well the gentleman did, but uh, I'm sure Aladdin did better. So, I, I mean, he's got to fight that. He's got to fight those Disney numbers. But otherwise, you know, that's fair. It'll I guess probably have, it will probably have a decent run. Yeah, I think it'll be okay. I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't see it going the wrong way. Uh, last story, the Golden Globes. This is the big, big story of the week, actually. Uh, and we're going to dig into this for a minute. Um, regarding the Golden Globes, Netflix is not going to be doing anything involving the Golden Globes until further reforms are made. This is a follow-up of a couple of recent stories regarding the Golden Globes, uh, namely around the Hollywood Foreign Press Association, who really is the organization that puts on the Golden Globes. Netflix, who last year took home more Golden Globes than everybody else, has said that this year... They're not entering any films into the Golden Globes. They don't want any awards from the Golden Globes. They want nothing to do with them, which is weird because these are the people that stand to gain the most from the Golden Globes. Interestingly enough, NBC has also said, hey, we're probably not airing the Golden Globes in 2022. In fact, I think they're or 2021, whatever, whenever it's up the next, next year, yeah, 2022. They're just not going to do it. Yeah, which is bananas. We've got actors and actresses who were tweeting about the Golden Globes. Tom Cruise has something to do with the Golden Globes, Lily. Andy, what the hell's going on with the Golden Globes? <laughs> uh, this is kind of a complex story, and I had to re really do some digging to see what what uh, has happened. Like I said, I, I saw these headlines, and I, I hadn't. It was difficult to find out what um, kind of they had done wrong. Uh, let me explain the Hollywood Foreign Press Association a little bit. It's a, a group of about maybe a hundred people. It's not a very big organization, as opposed to the, the Academy Awards has like several thousand, um, and they organized the, the Golden Globes and. You know, they're a different award ceremony than, than the Oscars, not taken quite as seriously, maybe a little bit more lighthearted. But like I said, it's it's an organization of 100 journalists or so that put on these awards. And uh, recently they were accused of basically not having a very much uh, diversity, inclusivity in their organization. It, found, it was found they had no uh, black members of their organization and um they they did attempt to put put um some new reforms or say they were going to change their association but about 10 percent of the organization voted against those reforms and those reforms that weren't really very uh, much either so all this along with um there was also some issues of essentially bribing uh for instance with the uh netflix tv show emily in paris uh, apparently some of the members got to go stay in a fancy hotel in paris to get a screening and then that uh show won so that's a really bad look so a lack of diversity inclusivity and bribing uh is not making them look good and everyone's kind of uh abandoning them now yeah, I'm glad to see Netflix being the first to kind of take the plunge here and say, hey, we're not going to have anything to do with this. This isn't OK. I mean, that that brought a lot of awareness to it. That triggered uh, Shonda Rhimes and Ava DuVernay, two prominent black writers and directors, uh, to step up and say, hey, good for Netflix. This is the right thing to do. Uh, qu very quickly after Reese Witherspoon tweeted about it, they've had a few other people kind of checking in since the most interesting one, I think as far as actors and directors are concerned, is Tom Cruise, who has won three Golden Globes, who has since said he's returning them. He's returning his Golden Globes. He doesn't want his, his best actor for Jerry Maguire, one for Days of Thunder, and one for Born on the Fourth of July. He's just like, you can have them. I, I, I want nothing to do with you guys, um, which is crazy. NBC saying they're not going to air them is a whole other beast. And, you know, I think the worst part of this, um, obviously, no, I take it back. The worst part of this is the lack of diversity and inclusion. That's really a problem. But the, the part that I think really bothers me, like <laughs> it bothers me a bit more than maybe it should. Is that regarding like the staying at a hotel for Emily in Paris and like big swanky events for members of the foreign press to hopefully kind of bribe for their vote? I kind of assume that's how these all worked anyway, right? I'm reminded of like when Lori Lolan, Lori Lolan was busted for uh, bribing her kid into college or whatever. I was like, I just kind of assume that's what rich people do. I kind of just thought that's how these ceremonies work, and they probably still are, honestly. But, you know, hey, good for them for cracking down on it and saying, no, no, this isn't fair. This isn't right. You know, if this is going to be an award show that's awarding and celebrating the best art, the best creativity of the year, then by God, it needs to stand on those merits. It shouldn't be, you know, a, a, a song and dance for people who can buy their way in. Yeah. I mean, the, there's a difference between campaigning and bribing. Um, yeah. I, I, I think um, also the Emily and Emily in Paris is trash. I had to watch some, some of the those episode. Not, All right, hold on. Not, not a great show, but anyways, I, um, I haven't seen it. I don't know. So that this is really go going to hurt them because 
award shows are essentially business opportunities. Um, they make a lot of money for the people involved, for the films involved, for the notoriety. Um, there's lots of sponsorship and things around them. So to not put on an award show is really hurts the people that that put those on no one else like nbc isn't gonna hurt obviously netflix isn't gonna hurt um also i i read only s about six million people watched them which is not a lot at all you know even the oscar is only about nine million so really not that much more uh so hopefully it will really pressure them to really reform their or organization um beyond i i think their reforms were like make the organization bigger yeah, I, I think that's definitely important. Also, maybe kick out some of those old old hats who think they know how it is. I mean, maybe they've been in the Hollywood Foreign Press for a little too long. Maybe maybe that's a possibility. Uh, long shot here. Uh, I, I don't know how this show can possibly continue to get funding or continue to be a thing without NBC's involvement, right? I mean, the, the Globes are just like the Oscars. If they're not on television, nobody can watch them. So they're going to immediately need something some kind of platform to step up and do something i mean they're, they're functionally deplatformed at this point they don't have a move so here's my hope maybe the golden globe stumbles blindly forward into the idea of premier streaming services for award shows and maybe the oscars will follow stead and we can start streaming our award shows for a change because if they were streaming this whole nbc threat wouldn't be that big of a deal now would it mm. yeah i i think we're still a long way uh from that and i mean this might actually just kind of be the end of them because like you said they're deplatformed no one's yeah. gonna want to give them that space also they're going to completely lack content like netflix is one of the their biggest um you know where where they have these awards from and if they don't have if netflix doesn't enter any of their content and properties then you know what kind of award show do you have left yeah not much of one i don't know i hope they turn it around i, I obviously do not have an affinity for the globes like i do for the oscars but you know what maybe there's some opportunity for change here hmm Maybe that's a, maybe that's a good thing, not just for the people behind the awards, but the awards themselves. That's and that's right. not a bad idea. And do you? And here, my hot my hot take that I've been uh, saying is that I think award shows themselves are actually kind of a thing of the past and should probably uh, just kind of go away. Like awards are great, but the pageantry, the length of these, like you know, multi hour award shows are just they were great for for an era before streaming, before the internet. You know, when it was difficult to see stars and all, all the that kind of things but um you know times have changed and they haven't That's really right. updated these kinds of award shows we have tmz now by god i don't need to see these people all sitting around being fancy i can see him get spilling coffee like ben affleck yeah you can follow uh, him I on can, instagram I, yeah i can see him stumbling with duncan it's great <laughs> uh and with that we should probably move into our first review of the episode i'm gonna be taking the summary on this one so please excuse my clumsy delivery the movie is guy ritchie's wrath of man so Wrath of Man is the story of H, a cold and mysterious character played by Jason Statham, who arrives at Fortico Security and Cash Trucking one cold Monday morning to get a job. Uh, he meets his, his, his tutor, Holt McCallany, uh, who explains how everything's going to work when you're driving a cash truck in L.A. Uh, this is a modern setting, by the way. This takes place now uh, in, in the year 2021. He meets some of the team, and then he starts driving cash trucks in Los Angeles, where 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 turns out there's a series of heists going on around town uh, for people ripping off cash trucks and murdering the people driving. Uh, Wrath of Man is a action-fueled Guy Ritchie thriller um, that's maybe a little lacking on action, but certainly has a lot to say about uh, storytelling and how Guy Ritchie kind of presents his characters. This is, this is Jason Statham's fourth outing with Guy Ritchie. Uh, he's had a history working with him in the past in some of his older movies like Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels. Uh, I'm excited to talk about this movie. Andy, what did you think of Wrath of Man? Um, so I actually really enjoyed this, and I didn't think I would. Uh, it looked kind of generic from from the trailer, um, and it is a little bit paint by numbers, but it has a lot of style. And Jason Statham does a good job as, as the main lead character, kind of this one man army, uh, uh, badass on a mission. Um, so I actually ended up enjoying it. I, I like this score. It's got a lot of good action, and kind of the way it films some of these uh, these heists or these robberies is is really kind of engaging, intriguing. Yeah, it's definitely a step in a different direction for Guy Ritchie. I, you know, I thought it was going to be a lot like The Gentleman or some of his previous pictures that are very much like lucrative, rich individuals uh, who are crime bosses or parts of some kind of crime syndicate doing something dirty or, or, or malicious. 
and having to get revenge or or go into a shootout like that's kind of what all these movies are right and i'm a big fan of them rock and roll is one of my favorite action movies probably ever i love that movie um so i really thought that's kind of what this was going to be really wrath of man feels a lot closer to guy Ritchie trying to tackle like a tarantino project um this movie is largely told out of order and yeah. guy Ritchie does not normally he kind of does that but like he doesn't really jump around in time and that was a really interesting feature of this i couldn't i couldn't shake that watching this movie it's just like man he's really tackling this story in a different way and i was surprised it was a good exercise for him i think yeah um, so we we start the story kind of in present day and then as we get into some of the other acts we jump backwards in time to get some uh kind of background on, on so certain characters and situations yeah we 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 start the film then we jump forward three months and then after a few scenes we jump back five months and then we jump forward two weeks from that and then we jump back forward up to like <laughs> modern time like it's 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 not a messy timeline but it feels messy watching it yeah but guy Ritchie is really good at telling these these kind of crime stories and these these kind of figures moving around and jason statham is pretty good in this movie it's it's definitely not his best performance if anything i thought he was a little lacking but he he's he's very good at playing this like cold hard man of action mystery right and 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 when he arrives at this the security trucking company everybody's kind of like afraid of him and then when he goes out and he starts doing these runs and he starts defending all of these cash trucks all the criminals get really afraid of him because he's ruthless and scary and nobody really knows what his deal is and he's got this kind of gravitas that guy Ritchie is very good at kind of injecting into his films at least in these characters matthew mcconaughey was great at it in, in the gentleman um so let's kind of just jump into it and talk about it a little bit i, I don't know where the best place to start, I suppose, kind of our wacky plot, and then we'll find our way into characters and direction shortly after. So, uh, like I said at the top, it opens on on Jason Statham arriving for to to apply for this job. He gets through training, he gets the bare minimum to pass, he gets out on his first job, and things go wrong. And Jason Statham saves the day, and everybody at the, at the office is like, "What the hell is this guy's deal?" Right? Like he's not a cop. He used to work in some kind of security what's going on and then wrath of man starts to kind of unfold this mystery a little bit which i also didn't expect you you kind of start to figure out okay who what is jason statham's deal exactly what what these characters named h which by the way nice touch for guy Ritchie. all the characters in this movie have 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 like one note names they're all nicknames of of security truck people so they'll have a guy named bullet or a guy named sweet boy or, or a guy named h like so just kind of goofy guy Ritchie names which is great um Andy, take this away from me. I've been talking way too long. So, <laughs> so this starts a really. There's a really good opening scene um, where one of these armored trucks get gets robbed, and it, it's it's it really grabbed me from the beginning because it's it's very uh, it's very grounded. It's very surgical. Like the this armor we see this armored truck get hit, um, and it's like a pro squad. They know exactly what to do, how to stop it, how to get into it, what to do with the the people inside, and that's kind of the thing that sets off everything in motion uh, for the rest of the, the movie is this, um, this initial heist. And that kind of sets the tone for the movie. It introduces some of our characters or at least a, you know, this, the security thing and that it's just, it's a really good opening scene. <laughs> Sorry. That's what I really want to talk about. Yeah. Uh, the, the plot and that, and like I said, it sets up a, a lot of interesting things. Yeah, and that, it's funny that opening scene really sets a tone for the rest of the film. Um, it's mostly uh, a single shot. I think there's like one or two cuts in there that are kind of hidden, but for the most part, it's like one single take for a big long mm -hmm. bit of this cash truck heist bit. Now it's a simple shot. It's it's a truck that's locked down in the back of a car uh, of a cash. If it's, it's a it's a truck, it's a camera that's locked down in the back of a truck as the truck kind of goes through this heist thing. Uh, you kind of figure out what's going on, um, but it's different. Guy Ritchie doesn't do that. And I was surprised, like from the from the first shot of the film, I was like, "Huh, this is different." I, I I didn't expect this, and it sets a good tone for the rest of the film. What What's interesting is this movie is a remake uh, of a 2004 French film called Le Convoyeur, uh, or Cash Truck, as it was released in America. I found a trailer for it um, on YouTube that the the old the, the for the 2004 film. It actually stars Javier Bardem. What was that like <laughs> six six years or Javier Bardem, uh, uh, Jean Dujardin. Uh, like six years before he won the Oscar for the artist because he's the lead in that. So like that was an up and coming movie in France. It obviously didn't make a splash here. This is a total 
total reimagining i think of that movie because because that trailer shows some similar elements but mostly this is the guy Ritchie version of it and i don't think that's a bad thing especially uh, uh given i mean just a departure from what it is from the title i think cash truck's a much better title than wrath of man but you know. yeah that, yeah the, t- the title is definitely terrible the title's bad yeah um but we we get uh we have interesting characters we have what seems to be a straightforward plot but then there's a number of of turns you might see coming some of you you might not uh but and like i said the non-linear storytelling mate makes it an interesting uh it, like i said it does while it is kind of a, a paint by numbers heist film it does enough things that it doesn't just feel like something you've seen before yeah um and, and i think that's that's strong i, I don't want to talk about um, characters I, I i apologize for leaning away from the plot we'll get into action for a minute but the fact is like this movie kind of sets up this kind of mystery you have to unfold as you watch it and i don't i feel like spoiling that would would yeah. ruin part of the experience so we'll, we'll keep that light but uh, you know, as far as the characters go in this movie, it's got a pretty good cast for what it's worth. We've got Jason Statham at the top. We have Holt McCallany for uh, it's kind of a mentor there. We've got Josh Hartnett returning to the screen. Have not seen him in a long time. Uh, Scott Eastwood is in this film, who I also did not expect. Uh, and and Andy Garcia, for some reason, is in this movie. I don't know if he just happened to be on set when they were filming and he was like, yeah, I'll read a couple lines or what. But he's he's briefly in this film. What's frustrating, I think, about the actors who are in this, who do a pretty fine job, is the characters they play are not that interesting. And that's weird, because that is something Guy Ritchie's really good at. Last last year's The Gentleman had a handful of interesting characters. Matthew McConaughey is this kind of like lion crime boss character. You, you got you got Colin Farrell as like a coach, and you had had uh, Charlie Hunnam as an interesting guy, and then and, and even Matthew McConaughey's wife had a whole thing and the villain. This movie doesn't doesn't really have that. I, I think everybody's kind of flat and I don't know if that's because it's in America. This is a second film set in America. This one's in LA or if it's just cause he's trying to do something different or maybe it's just supposed to be a more realistic setting. But most of the people who drive these trucks are not particular. They're just kind of one note. They don't get yeah. a lot of, yeah, they try you know. to establish this um, kind of culture of the security culture. And it's like, this is like you said, this is bullet and this is sweet boy. And this is wh- whoever. And uh, Dina or like, yeah, they all got names, yeah, yeah, right? which is cool. But yeah, the, yeah, but they're all kind of kind of one note to me. J- Josh Hartnett, I, I think, was kind of bad in this movie. Not the not that he's a bad actor, but like he's he's supposed to clearly be like the comic relief. And he just kind of overdoes it. Like he just seems re- yeah. really out of he, he it seemed it feels like someone auditioning for a movie instead of just being in a movie. Like it's just, it's a little bit too much and over the top and just, it kind of is distracting to me. Well, that's the funny thing. I, I felt the same way about, about Statham's performance being the lead, like the, the cold action stuff. Great. You, you like, you have an explosion go off behind Jason Statham while he's pointing a gun at somebody. Awesome. Anything else, man, like delivering lines or like bringing any emotional gravitas to what's supposed to be kind of the, the end of the second and third act of this film He's just kind of lacking. He was just kind of flat and cold and like a little, a little too much. And I was like, I don't know if he just didn't understand the script or like he just didn't get a good idea of where his character's head is supposed to be, but you never really break into what's going on inside. You know, you never really see what, only, what makes him tick. He kind of only has one mode though. Like Jason Statham is the same character in every movie. He's, he's, he is, in, you know? a, a, yeah. And that's, that's a good slide into the action in this movie. I think, uh, as far as the cash truck heist go, pretty good stuff. You know, not not the best I've I've ever seen. Uh, I, I when I saw the trailer, I likened this more to like a Michael Bay picture, and it's not. This is not like a Michael Bay movie. It doesn't have quite the flash and 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 the uh, the gravitas of that. But uh, there's a few high scenes over the course of this film. It's about two hours long. Not too shabby, I don't think. I mean, say them solid, right? And, and and also, whoever did the sound mixing, the gunshots are super loud in this movie, and that's not a bad thing. It makes everything have more weight. So. You know, what did you think, Andy? Yeah, the, I mean, there's plenty of action. Uh, that, and that's what this is, is an action heist film. Like I said, there's a heist that opens uh, the film. There's several other heists. There's shootouts. There's uh, some grisly gangster violence. There's definitely a lot of entertainment value. It uh, it kind of goes on a little bit too long in the third act. There's just like 20 <laughs> minutes of like nonstop action, which is a little bit much. But I mean, you, that's what you're there for. So the, there's, well, there's plenty of yeah. it. The problem is the action isn't nonstop enough. It actually stops a bit right in the middle of this yeah. kind of action scene and then picks back up. And that really kind of hurts the pacing, I think. Um, 
but but otherwise i mean solid solid action all around i enjoyed it i I did want to take a moment to talk about the music in this movie um very dynamic score typically i i think of guy Ritchie's movies as having you know okay music but i don't really notice it a lot usually he's using like more more licensed tracks from other artists and stuff you'd hear on the radio um this movie not so this has a very very prevalent soundtrack that is overhanging most of the film the music was done by christopher benstead who did the gentleman and aladdin guy Ritchie's last two films but he also did gravity and that's the one that stood out to me is like okay like you're the guy who has to fill the void of no noise with something and like very lots of strings very orchestral everything's in minor key everything feels like gloom and doom over these like drone shots of los angeles and these slow motion shots these big cash trucks and that's not a bad thing honestly it it was a little weird at first but i totally fell into it i I enjoyed the music in this movie a lot actually yeah i was gonna say i'm glad you brought that up because that was definitely one of the things i enjoyed really good original score this real heavy theme with like heavy low strings cello bass kind of thing it, it if you want to compare it to something to remind me a little bit of the score of uh of joker yeah. actually um yeah but yeah it, it really adds to the mood and and the feel of the the film and I, i've actually been listening to it some uh even after the the film so it definitely adds to the ambiance uh, one thing I think before we move on to recommendations, I, I do want to ask reg- regarding kind of the mystery and where it goes, where, where everything unfolds. Andy, did you feel like that was satisfying? Did you feel like it left something to be desired? Cause for me, it felt okay. I, I, I didn't really feel like it was a mystery worth hiding, but I thought about doing the show and I was like, the trailer doesn't reveal it. We should probably just keep it to ourselves. Um, it's you know it's all right it's it's all right i mean it's it's about the journey not the destination that's what Very i would all say like you're not going to be surprised by any anything there, that that you learn um it's not i don't feel it's trying to be that kind of movie it's more about you know once it sets up the pieces how do they get knocked down like that's that's more what you're there for yeah big time oh it, it, one more thing yeah Oh, I was going to remember that there's a really big heist in, in the film and it um, it's, uh, reminds me a little bit of Ocean's Eleven where like while the heist is taking place, it's being explained to you. There's a little bit of that, which is kind of helpful. That does happen, actually, which is important. Yeah. Laying out the the, the bits of a heist uh, as they're happening add, adds an odd bit of tension to it that makes it work. And I didn't mind that at all. Um, a bit more of that time play, playing with time in the film and, and what you're seeing versus what's actually happening, um, which is not a bad thing. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention, this movie features a very large uh, uh, introduction sequence that that plays like the intro to like, what's that? Any H- any premium HBO show. It looks like the intro to Westworld or the intro to, to, to True Detective. Um, it's kind of odd. I don't know. It's also split into parts and, and I couldn't help but feel like between this, this big bold introduction sequence they have, that's like two minutes long. And these kind of parts that was split into that maybe at some point, this was thought to be a series. Um, I'm going to be honest guy, Richie series, not a bad idea, not a bad idea at all. Anyway, any, any other thoughts for recommendations? No, I'm ready. Andy, would you recommend wrath of man? Yeah, absolutely. It's a lot of fun. It's an action heist film. You get a lot of both. You get a, a lot of these these robberies or attempted uh, robberies with these heist trucks. You get this kind of uh, criminal mystery going on with Jason Statham's character. Plenty of action to go around. Nice score. It's it's a fun time, and it's it like I said, it's a little paint by numbers, but it's an it's enough. It does enough stylistically different to keep things interesting. Yeah, I'm in the same boat. I think I'd recommend it too. It's not my favorite by him. I, I I honestly might recommend something like The Gentleman over this one, just but just because it's different. It's not bad. It's not worse. Um, it's just a step in a different direction for him. Um, I just like always. I'll be interested to see what he does next. I'm, I'm I think I'm just kind of a guy Richie stand at this point. I think I'll see anything this guy does. Uh, so you know, Wrath of Man, not too shabby. Maybe wait for streaming. I don't. I don't think you need to run to the theater to see it. That's for sure. Um, yeah. But you know, if you if you want to see something a little bombastic at the movie theater that you don't have anything good going on, you don't want to wait for uh, Army of the Dead here in a week. Uh, I don't know. Maybe try out Wrath of Man. You 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 might not be disappointed. If it's on a streaming service, you should totally check it out. That's what I think. And with that, we should move into the next section of our show. Andy, what 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 is this bit called? It's time for the trailer park. Perfect. So this week on the trailer park, we're talking about two different films. I'm going to take the first one and he's going to take the second one. The first movie is 
A24's The Green Knight. So The Green Knight is particularly exciting. Uh, <laughs> stars Dev Patel as one of the knights of Arthur's round table who is sitting at court one day when a odd, odd looking green man stumbles in with a strange face and, and demands a trial by combat that somebody fight him. And uh, Deb Patel hops up as Gawain, Sir Gawain, the knight and says, well, sir, Arthur, let me do it. The two of them take a swing at each other. He beheads the green knight. The green knight turns and looks at him with the beheaded. And he says, I'll be back in a year. Or something like that. That's really yeah. all I got out of the trailer. And then, and then what follows is a, a graphic and glorious quest across England and, and all of God's land to find, I guess, and vanquish the Green Knight. Uh, it's based on the story, of course. I don't know a lot about it. And, and the Green Knight was originally teased way back before the pandemic. We have waited all of this time for an A24 picture. Finally, this may be the art house American needs. I don't know. Andy, what do you think of The Green Knight? I am so excited for this movie. I've been wanting to see it for so long. It just, it it kind of, we saw a teaser and I was immediately hooked. It just oozes style. Like it, it, it's again, very, it, like it's both fantasy, but also very grounded. Looks really uh, you know, like dirty, grungy. And, you know, you got these interesting characters and, it, you know, it's a fantasy thing because he, he's got to kind of go on this quest to, to, like you said, vanquish the Green Knight. And along the way, he kind of has to overcome fantastical obstacles. Uh, but it just looks really like just grabs you and, and really intriguing. And, and this is our first look at it. Like we, we've been begging to see like some, some real footage and uh, we finally did. So I'm super excited. This comes out uh, July 30th. July 30th. I'm in the same boat. Chris, it's funny. Christine really wants to see it because she likes the story of the Green Knight. She likes Deb Patel, but she's like, what if it's scary? I was like, it probably will be scary. Like it's A20, it's A24. I would expect, but I don't know how scary. And she's like, well, what was it going to be like hereditary horror or like Nightmare on Elm Street horror? I'm like, I, you know, I couldn't tell you. That's, that's the fun of these movies. You never really know what you're going to get when you go in. But either way, David Lowry's The Green Knight looks like a lot of fun. Yeah, and what's interesting is I've actually seen I've actually seen the, the rest of his uh, filmography or his major uh, other films, uh, which include. Uh, I got it uh, pulled up. A ghost story, right. uh, the old man and the gun, which I really wanted to see. Uh, Peach Dragon, which as I've heard it, Peach Dragon, the live action Peach Dragon is one of the best live action Disney adaptations. I haven't seen it, but supposedly it's actually good. So I don't know. Um, yeah, I've seen, I haven't seen that one. I have seen the old man and the gun, which is very good. And then also ain't them body saints, uh, which starred Casey Affleck and Rooney Mara and was about, uh, Casey Affleck has to rob banks to try and support his family. And it's like this Southern Gothic, uh, tale, really good film. So I'm, I'm super excited as him. As, and I didn't realize he had done all of those films and he'd done uh, this. And I've seen a ghost story as well. I don't think about David Lowry on IMDb. His first list is an editor and a director second because he's he's primarily an editor. He's directed 11 more features. He's edited 11 more features and he's directed and he edits all his own work. So I don't know, kind of cool. Anyway, Andy, what else is coming out? Venom. Oh, wait, I forgot what it was. It's got a full title. Let me say it again. Venom. Does it? Oh, it does. Venom, Let There Be Carnage. Uh, so this was a surprise trailer that dropped on, I think it was on uh, Monday yesterday of uh, the follow-up to, I think it was 2018's Venom, starring Tom Hardy. Let There Be Carnage is hinting at another symbiote uh, named Carnage played by... Oh, I can't Woody Harrelson. Remember. Woody Harrelson, thank you. Uh, this trailer doesn't really give us a lot of new stuff. It basically looks like the first, like you could have said this was the first trailer and you wouldn't know too much difference. Um, th there's a weird humor, their approach to Venom, the, the Venom Tom Hardy relationship is kind of weird. There's this strange humor between them. Um, so we did, we, we don't get a lot in the trailer. We do get to see Woody Harrelson who turns into carnage. Um, but I don't really, I'm not super familiar with these characters, uh, comic book wise, but, uh, it, it looks interesting enough. What do you think? So fans of the show may remember where Andy and I did not particularly enjoy the first Venom film. Uh, and this one definitely looks similar in tone. I, I think they've taken some direction now that they don't have to tell the origin story of Venom and they can kind of just say, hey, Tom Hardy has this symbiote that lives with him. Uh, they, they've kind of leaned into that to create a bit of like humor for the character it, it, this trailer opens with with venom helping him make breakfast and it turns this horrible mess and he's got like a pizza box taped to the wall that says no eating people and and venom has become like this charming 
sh devil on my shoulder kind of character, which is very, I mean, as far as I know, very, very different from the comics where Venom is like haunting uh, Eddie Brock and, and is this horrible thing he has to like not only deal with, but try to overcome. Uh, Carnage seems to be much more of that. Carnage seems to be a lot more like this horrible uh, plague on the city that, that that Venom is going to have to, to deal with. But despite it's like charming underpinnings and like the cutesy breakfast scene, I have a feeling that will be a small portion of the film and much of it will be a CGI action fest between CGI Venom and CGI Carnage fighting each other. And maybe that's not a bad thing, but ultimately I don't, I don't see the longevity in this, in this series. Where is it going? Cause at some point Venom fights Spider-Man and he's the bad guy. So I, I just don't, I don't see where we're headed here. Like, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't see the, the Yeah. Tunnel. The Venom verse is a little unclear. The, the effects are really good. That was, that was one of the things that stood out from the first movie, the, the fighting effects of, of Venom when he fights other kind of symbiote things uh, is really cool, but that's kind of the only thing I, I remember. And you're right. If we're just going to do the same thing, you know, CGI villain fights CGI villain. Uh, yeah. What exactly are we, do we have to look forward to? The only things I remember from the first Venom film are like Riz Ahmed really trying to be a bad guy and me really pulling for him from the back row, man. I was like, come on, Riz, you could do it. You're you. You could be evil. And also that weird scene where like Tom Hardy climbs into a lobster tank at a restaurant. Like, I don't know why that sticks in my head, but otherwise I don't remember anything about that first movie. And it was a hit. People liked it. So, you know, hey, I'll try to go into Venom 2 with fresh eyes, but like, I'm just you know, he's one of those things. Know. He's one yeah. of those villains that, that people just love. You know, it's like the Joker. You put him on screen, people are going to go and see it. Right. Yeah, I think that's true. And, and hey, who knows? Maybe Venom Two will, will, will take some kind of direction from the failings of its previous work and and, and turn into something better. I, who, who knows? Time will tell. All right. <laughs> All right. Oh, uh, here I'll jump. I'll jump into the rest of it. Uh, so that that uh, does it for the well, trailer. Tell us, tell uh, us when that's out. Oh God, yeah, that <laughs> you put me on the spot. That's out uh, September twenty fourth. Yeah, that's right. So that'll be a fall fall release. We'll look forward. To. We'll probably see it for the show. Andy put nine twenty four on the guide, and it took me exactly what eight seconds for me to <laughs> decipher that that was September because I'm I went to college. I got some college. Next up, uh, our last film we're reviewing on the episode, uh, an old favorite of Andy's. Andy, how the hell did we get to watching this movie? And then give us the announcement and let's jump into it. Uh, so I saw this come up on HBO Max uh, a while back. And I, I kind of, I, I rewatched it a few weeks ago, half paying attention. And I was like, man, I really remember uh, a lot of this or, you know, there's a lot of great things. And then so I suggested we watch it for the show on a slow week. And so we've rewatched it again. Um, and here we are. And this is, the, <laughs> and th this is this is Bram Stoker's Dracula. So this is the 1992 Dracula epic directed by Francis Ford Coppola with this all-star cast. Uh, these are all stars still today. Gary Oldman, Winona Ryder, Anthony Hopkins, Keanu Reeves, Richard E. Grant, Carrie Elwes, uh, and Tom Waits, Monica Bellucci. Uh, I mean, these are all huge names now, and they were big names uh, then. Um, this uh, this movie tells the epic story of one Dracula, uh, played by Gary Oldman, who is kind of a victim of tragedy in 15th century Ottoman Empire, curses uh, curses God and religion, and uh, turns to be, he becomes Dracula uh, after the death of his his beloved uh, Elisabetta played by Winona Ryder. He then kind of comes back to to the fold at 400. 300 400 years later comes back to Eng england to kind of seduce and terrorize england and and uh, kind of win back his reincarnated bride uh, mina again played by winona Ryder. uh this movie's got a lot of of everything it's um it's both like it's it's got horror it's got a lot of like erotic thriller natures to it we got some che cheesy effects, cheesy lines. Uh, Anthony Hopkins is ki is kind of the um, uh, com comedic relief, and again, it's it's kind of a soap opera of sorts. Francis Ford Coppola, big epic director, and it's it's definitely a product of its time, and it's got a lot going on. It's kind of an, an overload of the senses. Some things are really great, and it's got some really incredible filmmaking, and then some things are are really kind of eyebrow raising. Um, and it's an old favorite of mine, nearly 30 years old at this point. 
Zach, so, what do you think? <laughs> Andy, I need you. I need. I need you and the rest of the world to understand. I, I really wanted to like this movie. I really did. I because it's always been this weird like black sheep on the movie shelf, right? You see it on the end. It's got a cool cover. It says love never dies. And then you see the memes and like Gary Oldman looks weird in every scene. And Keanu Reeves says Budapest wrong every time. And it's just like Budapest. What What is this film? (laughs) Bram Stoker's Dracula won four Oscars in 92 when it came out. Makeup, uh, uh, set design, uh, I don't know, sound mix. Yeah, something editing. This is an academy, a multi Academy Award winning film. It has an incredible cast that continues to impress to this day. People showed up in this movie while I was watching it. I was stunned. At one point, <laughs> Carrie, Carrie Elwes shows up in The Princess Bride. And I was like, oh, what's he doing in this scene? He's in the rest of the film as like a main player. I was, I was amazed. Anthony Hopkins turns up at one point. It was crazy. The casting choices are insanity in this movie, and it just keeps <laughs> delivering like great casting choice after great casting choice. Now, some of them may not be a great fit. Keanu Reeves was standing, but otherwise, it feels like everybody, um, I don't know. I was just really impressed by how many people turned up in this film. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Gary Oldman, definitely, he knocks it out of the park. Is, is Several versions of, of Dracula. You know, you got old, old weathered, you know, the, the kind of famous looking with the, the giant, like, two buns of hair. Yes. Super evil looking. Like, he's not convincing anyone he, he's not evil. Um, as well as, you know, a very young uh kind of handsome dracula and then is several incarnations in between you know you have like wolf version bat version it you know demon version there's a he's got a lot of different looks and kind of a lot of different accents to to kind of, of do and, and then of course you have the great anthony hopkins as van, van helsing uh tom Waits shows up as renfield which uh, i heard they're actually making a series about this character and this is kind of a he, he is a, kind of a henchman of, of dracula um, and then, of, of course, Winona Ryder is also very good. She's she's like the um, Kira Knightley of the '90s. Is, is kind of how she has it. Like she looks great in a period uh, pick. And then you do have County Reeves, who's I just feel is miscast. Like there is no amount of like hair and makeup that's going to make me think he's British at all. No, he he should have just stuck with the American accent and then just like said nothing about it. I mean, I mean, I, I was under the impression a good chunk of this film takes place in America, but it doesn't. I think it takes place in just strictly it's all Europe, London, right? London, yeah, but, or, yeah, I, London, and then Europe. Yeah, wouldn't even know it. Um, mo- mostly because there's some overseas travel that's mentioned a few times. So this is very strictly based on like the the original Bram Stoker book. That's where this all comes from, right? Because otherwise, it feels like just a total fever dream of a telling of the, of the Dracula story, but that's where we get this, this Keanu Reeves character, Jonathan Harkness, who is traveling to, to, to pick up this job from this other guy who went crazy, who was serving this count Dracula in Transylvania. Like it's, it's very much the original telling just, I guess I wasn't too familiar with the original story, Dracula falling in love with Jonathan Harkness's woman. And then that having like a weird connection through time to his old lover, that stuff's all not, super messy honestly what's messy is the way that stuff is told because it's very right. visual lots of visual montage and transitions and dutch angles and bright colors I, it's, I mean it's all over the place visually yeah so the the first act of this i, I feel works really strong you have this opening telling a, of uh, count dracula in the like you know 1500s he's uh what looks to be kind of like the crusades he goes out to to fight in in the name of the lord comes back to find his 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 love dead and he then curses god and and man and there's this brilliant scene of like blood flowing out of a cross and candles and he's just like drinking it and yelling it. it's just like it's so much it's like an assault on on the senses and then kind of the second half of the first act you have uh jonathan harkness going out to to meet count dracula in his super creepy castle obviously super evil all the time you get it, it helps it helps to um to watch this with subtitles because so, some of what is said is a little unintelligible by by dracula and you, you'll miss a lot um but there's a lot of cool like shadow effects like you know where sh- dracula's shadow does something different than his his own body and like he seems to kind of teleport around the castle like he they clearly have him on, on like a dolly because he just kind of like glides everywhere he doesn't walk yeah and like the problem is it looks like it somehow visually 
there's a lot. I mean, there's a lot going on on screen between the lighting and and any practical effects. Which is this this movie is full of cool practical effects. Andy's right. I mean, just a small one is Dracula moving independently of a shadow in the background, which like is, is you know they didn't do that with CGI back then. That was a practical effect. They had to work out how to do that, and, and it looks really good. There's a ton of like crane shots, dolly shots. Yeah, they 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 got Gary Oldman on wheels because he's he's <laughs> not walking. He's like he's kind of floating. Gliding. Lots of little subtle things, transformation scenes. You, you, you got fangs coming out of uh, gums and like all kinds of stuff going on in this movie. And all that stuff's really good. I think the problem is because of how it's aged, somehow a lot of it comes off looking camp. A movie I thought of a lot watching this was Joel, Joel Schumacher's Batman and Robin right. or Batman Forever. Like it, it somehow resembles a lot of that. And this is supposed to be Coppola's like, I mean, one of his crowning achievements this was coming off The Godfather. This was coming off The Conversation. This was coming off I mean, some of his best work. And and after this, he did Jack with Robin Williams, and then he didn't <laughs> do much else. And like this really feels like this was supposed to be some kind of pinnacle, and it turned into a cliff for him. Mm -hmm. I, I remember um, it might have been you or someone else told me that uh, Coppola refused to do any kind of CGI or digital effects. And this is back when this was digital effects were just starting out. Um, this would have been shot in 1990, 1991. Uh, and so everything is practical and it looks a little old school in, in a lot of uh, scenes, particularly big landscape scenes. You can tell they're using like matte paintings. You can tell miniatures, they're kind of, yeah, yeah. Mi miniatures. They're, they're kind of fading film across each other. Like, the, it, yeah, it just looks cheesy. Like there's parts where like someone's reading a letter and then you see someone like the ghost of someone kind of float up to represent what's in their mind. Or you see like eyes in the sky and it's really, it's really kind of cheesy. It, it's like straight out of the eighties. Um, but but it's got a certain charm to it. But then you have like some of the incredible, like the smaller stuff is what looks really good when there's like four or five people in a scene and there's blood everywhere. There's action like that stuff is really intense. Yeah. Like it, Coppola's commitment to vision is like un, unmatched. Like even if it, and that's the thing, even if it's like not necessarily the right vision, the fact is like he never once leans away from it. He goes all the way in the weird transitions, the kooky looking effects. And I have to feel like most of it in camera did not look that good. And they were just like, we don't care, but we're, we're just, we're barreling forward with this thing. We're doing it. I mean, the movie opens with it right from the start. We see Dracula's ridiculous armor on his, on his outfit. He looks like a freaking power ranger villain. <laughs> and like, that's the, that's the opening of the film. Like it just lets you know from the start, Hey, this is going to be a weird ride. Get ready. And like, it never once lets off. It feels like a movie that's plucked from an alternate dimension or something. And in that way, I really respect it. I really do. But like, I just could not, at least in the first watch, I couldn't get on board with what it was doing. <laughs> Andy's right. I didn't watch with subtitles and that's a mistake. You need to be able to, to understand what they're saying. And Oldman's accent is, I mean, just like Coppola did not like half-ass it. Oldman does not half-ass the performance. He goes so hard in this movie on the Dracula stuff. I feel like he was really committed to the role. He really wanted it to be cool. And it just falls flat on its face. And like, I don't, I'm not sure how that happens. There's a bit of gravitas to him. He's, he's kind of interesting, but like, it's hard not to just write him off as this Nosferatu villain that you kind of don't care about, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, it's definitely this, uh, you know, like the, this love across time and, and ages. And he's, you know, he's, he's seen his, his beloved bride reincarnated in, in Mina, uh, why not writer's character. And he, you know, longs after her and there's, you know, he eventually comes to England to find her and kind of wreak havoc on, on the land as he, he does these things. And this is where we kind of get into act two, where he, he comes in, he comes to England, bringing the drip. And, and just oh like, yeah. Big time blue glasses for God's sake. Yeah. I was, I was like, no one stands a chance here. Um, and, and where he, he runs it. And again, he's got his thick Romanian accent. And then that's, I almost feel like some of it, you're not really supposed to understand. So it's a little bit Chris Nolan -y that, that way where you're just supposed to, uh, it's kind foreign of lost accent. in the drawl of like, yeah. His, yeah, his charm. But, but this is where, you know, this heart of, of this starts to, it, like, even though Mina is in, is engaged, she meets, uh, you know, a young handsome Count Dracula on the street and they kind of get to talking and they start having dinner together and, you know, they kind of start to fall for each other. Meanwhile, she also has this, uh, her friend Lucy, who's kind of a, who's a, a wealthy aristocrat, uh, also looking to get married, also kind of crude and, and lewd, who is at one point bitten by a vampire and slowly descends into, you know, becoming one herself. And that's, uh, 
another interesting kind of foil to this where we also get some really kind of incredible scenes. Yeah. So we, we should talk about Lucy for a moment. This kind of like disheveled friend of Winona Ryder who is, who is kind of, kind of, kind of a placeholder for what vamp for what Dracula can do. He ends up, uh, uh, you know, biting her after having his way with her, I think. Um, and she kind of goes through these stages of becoming this, this, this bride of, 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 dracula right like this this mm-hmm. this undead thing she opens the door for uh anthony hopkins van helsing to kind of come into the picture when her when her beau uh played by carrie elwes is like hey we need to call a doctor something is seriously wrong mm-hmm. with my 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 to be to betrothed here mm-hmm. uh somehow anthony hopkins character comes into the picture and and we kind of go off on that route but lucy is is a good kind of point to talk of, of contention i think in the film we're talking about because she's so sexualized which is important in this movie there is a lot of sex in this movie. There's a yeah. lot of like this movie is so thirsty, dude. Like it's it's crazy. <laughs> it's uncomfortable. I, just that, kind of thinking, yeah, it's yeah. it's too it's almost too much. Yeah, it, it's uncomfortable now because we have to remember uh, there there was a time in the '90s, the time of the erotic thriller, when you know audiences. This was before the internet, before you know that kind of material was much more easily accessed, and people went to the movies to see, you know, to see skin. And you know, basically, Polly would make would make a lot of what is like basically soft core porn. And this is definitely in that vein. You know, there, there there's a, a number of weird love scenes. There's one with uh, Count of Reeves and Dracula's brides, which is re- like that kind of comes out of nowhere. Like, you're like what yes. is this and again maybe that that's to show us like what lucy and and mina m- m- could eventually uh become but there's yeah lots of sexualization very and a lot of like sexual imagery and nudity talking. yeah totally yeah, well, well with, with like especially with things like they talk about like being bitten and like penetration and just like there's a, a lot of these very like oh yep. not subtle not overt or, or very overt um symbolism in in wrapped into the to like the dracula mythos for some reason it's weird because i've never seen any kind of like you know telling of the dracula mythos in this way no it's it's very it's very strange um i also wanted to to, to mention kind of its gothic horror roots because that's another thing this movie does really well is it is a very gothic picture which is not 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 normally a term i ascribe to something but it's hard it's hard to deny that's what this is there is so much like dark and brooding shadowy imagery in this movie i mean just looking at dracula and kind of his inspiration from nosferatu uh to 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 every element of like the dracula tale you know the garlic the crosses not going out in daylight having to uh, not being welcomed into rooms and stuff mirrors breaking when you see him his shadow moving around on itself like it checks every box for dracula yeah. which is why it makes sense in a lot of ways this movie isn't remembered as bram stoker's dracula it's just called dracula i like calling it bram stoker's dracula because it's easy to distinguish from other dracula pictures but if you look this up on, on imdb it's just dracula like the just the title of the movie is dracula and in that way it definitely owns that role like it, it tries to hit every high mark of what a dracula is supposed to be yeah, you, you hit on all the uh, all the familiar points, uh, like you just mentioned, and then it, it tells this other kind of like the whole love story angle. And apparently the reason it's called Bram Stoker's Dracula is because someone else owns the rights to just Dracula as a title. So, okay. they, had to, so they had to put something in front of it uh, yeah. so it would uh, to avoid copyright uh, violations. But yeah, like, like I said, that there's there's so much go- uh, going on here. And this this love story, I, I guess you're either on board with it or you're not, but it's weird because there's there's Dracula and Mina, there's Jonathan Harkness and Mina, there is Lucy and her suitors, um, and whole lots of like just sexual tension and imagery. And and again, this was for thirsty 1992 audiences that didn't have the internet for that sort of thing. Right. This is this is where you went for thrills and chills, right? And that's exactly what this movie is claiming to provide. Any 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 hot takes on the uh, like absurdist surreal art style surrounding this movie? Because obviously Bram Stoker's original novelization did not have any images. Like they had to cook this stuff up, and like, dude, they they leaned into it so hard. Oh my god! So I read that that Coppola had just he really looked to those early like Nosferatu, those those movies from the the twenties and thirties for inspiration, and that's part part of why he didn't want to use any digital effects. But yeah, it, it some of it looks really old school, or I mean, it looks like a movie from the early eighties, ten year ten years younger fantasy films, and like I said, Eyes in the Sky or 
different images popping. This there's this really bad effect of of blue fire at the beginning that's super cheesy, uh, almost looks like animation on on top of it. So you know sometimes some of the stuff just flat out doesn't work. I don't think it worked then. I don't think it works now. But that's juxtaposed with really intense smaller scenes that I think work. There's a lot of like kind of grotesque action which I think we should talk about. Yeah, we should. Um, I, I did want to say uh, regarding the visuals, the, the visuals really are one of the reasons I think I'd like to see this in a theater if possible. And I don't, I don't know what theater would ever run this movie. Um, I, I, it's not exactly high on the list of like things to watch in a movie theater, right? Like, I don't know if this movie would break the bank at the box office uh, for a retro screening, but the visuals are so striking. I feel like maybe if I was, you know, in, in a theater in a dark room, just engulfed in that red coming off the screen and like kind of these bold visuals, like maybe I'd feel differently. I mean, I loved, I, I loved Mandy from uh, panels, panels Cosmatos. And that is kind of not a great, structural film but like the visuals are so striking it kind of brought me around and i really came into it um i wish i had been able to have that experience at home right yeah i mean the, there's some like i said the opening is really powerful it, it's bloody that you know there's kind of this uh the story's told kind of through shadow puppetry uh at the beginning as well it gets really bloody when he like curses god and man and then there's several other like um pretty just intense scenes like uh but dracula's brides or lucy as she starts to kind of slowly turn into a vampire when we meet other versions of dracula which are like as as in bat form or in other other forms they're you know and they're trying to and i, and I mean they're armed with like guns and knives and they're trying to like you know do some damage and there, there's parts i mean that i mean it's it's like full-on horror levels of gore blood splays rain <laughs> everywhere and it's just like good god man yeah like just really going for it um it's funny that yeah coppola's next movie was jack starring robin williams like a very uh, like a, a family movie about a man who's trapped in or child trapped in a man's body i guess is kind of the gag there but much more wholesome like it, this this feels in a lot of ways like coppola's temple of doom right like yeah. steven spielberg did temple of doom and after that he was like okay i'm not doing violence like that anymore like ripping a guy's heart out of his chest and and lowering him into a pit of lava was too much like i gotta i gotta take it easy and this th feels like the same way like coppola just i mean and again i respect the vision he just goes for it like he never lets off for a second and like that's awesome but it's just it's just too much in the wrong way and and like that's that's a bummer for me but i, I mean and did you like this the first time you saw it? I mean, were you just in rapture or did it take a while? I mean, this is one of those things that like, I don't think I ever saw it in one full sitting for the longest time. I remember seeing it advertised like crazy in the early nineties. And then it was, it would have been on TV. Like that's where I would have seen it. I, it would have been on TV a bunch and you know, TV, you would have seen a TV friendly version you know? version so, of so, this yeah. so a lot of it so i remember not seeing the opening for the longest i remember always just kind of starting in, in dracula's castle and never seeing really? the opening like five five ten minutes which is like sets up the whole thing and it's a very really very strong opening yeah yeah so you know i i kind of a few years ago went back and watched it and i was like man this is really different um so i it's one of those things i just grew grew up watching on on tv kind of it's like you know star wars used to come on tv all, all the time so you'd always just kind of jump in on a sunday afternoon and and catch the rest of it and that's kind of how how this was and it's just something that i've kind of all, always liked uh ever since uh ever since and it's uh yeah i think it's probably definitely an acquired taste a small observation from me before recommendations um you know not that long ago i rewatched 1999's the mummy starring brendan Fraser and rachel vice uh that movie came out seven years after this one and it beat for beat picks up the same antagonist story like love story a knocks yeah. to the moon dies in the past imhotep's like i'll find you through time he comes back to the to, to in present time he finds rachel vice Oh, you were, you look just like her, even though she looks nothing. I'm, like at least Winona Ryder plays both roles. Like in, in that movie is different, but weird. Just a funny, a funny thing. And I think Universal, I don't know if Universal had a piece at this one. I think it was MGM made this movie. Um, but Universal owns the rights to film Dracula now. So I do wonder if there was any crossover there, like any kind of, mm -hmm. I don't know. But anyway, Andy, you ready for recommendations? Just about. I have one last thing to say, and that's uh, Please, the, yeah. the score. Really love the score uh, for oh, this yeah, film. Um, 
which I can't remember the, now. I can't remember the uh, composer. It's not. It's not someone that that's really well known. But phenomenal score. Very, uh, very old school. More kind of operatic, or in the style of like older Star Wars, the original Star Wars films. Kind of that themes for our good guys and bad guys, the hunters party kind of thing. Um, really love the score. Added it to my uh, soundtracks playlist on on Spotify. So that's that was kind of the last thing I wanted to add. Is really phenomenal score. Everybody go follow Andy's soundtrack playlist on Spotify. It's good <laughs> stuff. But yeah, I, funny funny thing you mentioned that. I, I forgot about until you just said that. Uh, it is rare that a film score sticks with me so well that I feel like I can hum it. But this one, I feel like I'm never going to forget that. Yeah, like that, yeah. that kind of like it's really sticks with me. And I realize now it sounds like Batman when I say it back. But yeah, no, like this, this, this score is actually really dynamic in this movie. Very, very good. Great visuals. Um, just an odd odd choice of tone i think uh andy would you recommend bram stoker's dracula i would i would highly recommend it it's uh you know for the horror fans for the dracula fans uh it's got a little bit of everything it's got romance it's got horror it's got mostly great uh performances a lot of iconic scenes uh there's some things that don't work things that are, are dated like i said the eroticism is a bit over the, the top and not what you would not is simply not what are, are in films now most of the time or even when it's in films it, it's very different think of something like the hand uh not the handmaid's tale hand the handmaiden or blue is the warmest color even then th that has changed drastically so like i said it was for a very thirsty audience that couldn't have access to that sort of material at the time um but like i said great great visuals great costumes great hair and makeup some campy effects uh great score so it's a bit it's a big favorite of mine i would admit probably an acquired taste uh but i highly recommend it. and that's available on hbo max so i feel like i would recommend this movie but i don't know who to recommend it to i, would, I wouldn't recommend it to general audiences i wouldn't recommend it to my parents i wouldn't no. recommend it to like a good friend as like a fascinating watch I'd probably recommend it to somebody who listens to the show, somebody who is obviously a little invested in movies and the kind of the art of how they're made. Because like, like I said earlier, like this movie feels like it was tugged out of another dimension and just dropped here. Like it's, it's so unique. The vision is so bold. The visuals are so striking. The music is great. The casting is great. The makeup kills the set design. Like so much about it is so cool. But somehow I don't like it. And it's just because <laughs> the dialogue and the tone of where everything goes just doesn't do it for me. Like, it's just a little too all over the place. I need a couple years to sit back and get away from it. Probably a good rewatch. I think I'll come around someday. I really do. Because I really respect a lot about what happens in this movie. But ultimately, not for me, but for somebody, for sure. Right. Well, it's it's one of those things. It's like I was saying with with Mortal Kombat uh, last week, where I was really disappointed because I was expecting a certain kind of movie, and you and you weren't because you weren't expecting much. And so it's one of those things. Now, once you know what it's about, kind of the the path it it treads, it'll it'll be different upon second rewatch. Right. It's exactly how I came around on 2001 Space Odyssey. First time, I was like, I thought this movie was going to be cool. I watched it. It was lame. Second time, after a few years, I was like, oh, now I get it. Like, I if you go in thinking, oh, I don't really know what I'm going to get into, it'll be something. But through time, these movies leave an impression on history, on society. And you think back to the Bram Stoker's Dracula that Gary Oldman and Keanu Reeves are in. Well, that's got to be killer, right? And you watch it and you're like, oh, maybe not. But it's still good, just in a unique way that I didn't expect. Right. So, yeah. And then for that, uh, I think that wraps our show. Andy, what are we watching next week? Uh, we got a few titles and big new releases next week, um, which I need to pull up my sheet again. But I know we have Spiral from the Book of Saw, so the, the next movie in the Saw franchise. Uh, and that's it, theaters exclusively, and that stars Chris Rock and Samuel L. Jackson. We'll see what that's about. Uh, also, Army of the Dead for one week only um, in Cinemark and other theaters will be playing starting Friday for just one week before it comes out to uh, theaters. And then also, if you're interested, uh, those who wish me dead will be coming out on both HBO max and in theaters. We're actually gonna be taking a break next week. So I'm out of town, but we will come back to do spiral and army of the dead. That's right. Off next week. When we come back, Spiral and Army of the Dead, you got two weeks to watch them and catch up with us. So if you have the means, watch those movies and then listen in a couple weeks when we review them. If you enjoyed the show today, if you enjoyed what we're doing here, if you had hot takes about the movies we watched, maybe you agreed, maybe you disagreed, let us know in the comments below. You can comment on YouTube where we post our episodes every single week on Facebook where we live stream every Tuesday at about 5 p.m. CST. 
uh, on iTunes, on Google Play, Spotify, iHeartMedia, anywhere else you find your podcast. You can, of course, well, I take it back. You can't leave a, you can't leave a comment on where you find your podcast, but you can leave a rating and review, which might be even more important than just leaving a comment. That lets us know how we're doing, whether you like the show or didn't like the show, and it helps us a ton on the back end, more than you know. If you can't do that, if you don't want to comment, if you don't have any hot takes, then the very least you could do for us, if anything, if you feel like giving back, is just subscribe. Just subscribe to the show to get new episodes every single week delivered straight to your phone. You keep up with the movies, you keep up with the news, and you keep up with all of our hot takes over here at Offscript. From all of us at Offscript, the home of Bold Cinema, I'm Zach Lewis. And I'm Dr. Draper. Thanks for watching.